Hello, and welcome back to the Self Healer Soundboard. When we were trying to figure out what we wanted to chat about for today's episode, uh, we were looking at what we've been chatting about in our own day-to-day lives and have really wanted to lean more episodes towards an open conversation or just a conversation in general and not always a practical how-to. Here's an issue, how to solve it. Because we're also you know, aware that we're not solving anything for anyone. We're only ever sharing our perspectives, our experiences, and our lives. So what we wanted to chat about today was our humanness and our spirituality and how easy and how often it is to kind of take flight in this devotion or commitment to a spiritual growth or a higher perspective of ourselves. And while that's beautiful and powerful in the process, many of us avoid or then negate the fact that we are still humans in a human body and really both need to be integrated together. I think a really great place to ground this conversation to begin for all of you out there who are wondering what the heck we even mean when we're referencing a spiritual self. Um, That could be really any word that we want to label that uniqueness that makes all of us the individual that we are, whether it's essence, spiritual, soul, or many of you, if you're tuning in here on our YouTube channel, you're seeing a set change. Um, And what you're seeing up is we just got a delivery of the workbook that will be published into the world in December. And the workbook is called How to Meet Yourself. So that same self is what we're referring to here which is that authentic space of being. Again, the pure essence, the energy, whatever the language that jives with the way you think about who you are, it's the being that's inside, that's living in that physical body. So of course, um, I'm only referencing the workbook again because we definitely had a set change that is noticeable and because the workbook is really a roadmap of peeling back to really define that space for many of you who are unsure of where that lives inside of you. And if you're listening to the audio on this and can't see the cover or haven't heard of the workbook yet, it's how to meet yourself in what is that? Five words? Five. So yourself are two separate words. You're meeting yourself, yourself being that essence, that true nature, the divine creator, whatever you want to call it, that thing or that energy or that idea and belief that there is something larger and greater at play. There is something beyond just me and my everyday life. There is something that breathes life through each of us, allows our heart to beat, our lungs to breathe air, our fingernails and our hair to grow without us doing anything. It all just happens and exists, much like we plant a seed. It grows roots, it blooms, it flourishes, it dies off and goes into the same cycle again in the springtime. We are no different. We are nature and we are natural beings. So we're using the word spirituality and the nature of this conversation just as easy reference for whatever that idea or belief you have is that is beyond you now. And in conversation about this, when Nicole and I were just chatting, The term that then kept coming up that we wanted to focus on is this idea of spiritual bypassing. And spiritual bypassing is actually a term that came to me sometime in this last year or two that I had never really heard of before. I think Lolly actually mentioned it to me, and it was in reference to how much of my life really was spent spiritually bypassing and not really even understanding it or knowing what that was. So The term spiritual bypassing, just for some context, was actually termed in 1980 by a psychotherapist named John Wellwood. And he was a practicing Buddhist, noticing in himself and others in his community that often there was a a draw or a commitment to working on themselves, to evolving, to becoming one with a higher consciousness, you could say. And again, that's a term I'm just lending out here. You might use different language and that's okay. Though what he was noticing is that in the process of this commitment to working on self, there was almost an avoidance or a roundabout way of actually dealing with the human emotions, with anger, resentment, fear, things that he calls psychological issues that we might call here unresolved trauma. Even just hearing this concept, unresolved psychological issues or trauma, again, as many of you have been tuning into this podcast or our work in general, we can locate that 
in our body. So back to that seed that you were talking about earlier, I was actually having a whole visual of this inner essence, right? This uniqueness that is us, that is quite literally firmly implanted in this human shell of a body. So to speak to this point that that psychologist John Wilward was making, right, also residing in those bodies, as those of you who have tuned into our discussions on emotions, are our emotions. So what we're really talking about here is how do we make that bridge between this other, you know, really undefinable, maybe not even physical aspect of our existence, this essence, the soul, the spirit, again, whatever it is for you, and that bridge between the physical body in which that resides, in which it becomes the filter, the body, all of our perceptions, all of our senses, often directed or always, I should say, directed by our nervous system, our body then becomes a filter for that inner being inside of us. So it really is that communication between or that bridge, that interface. And I think the discussion we're really having here is how do we navigate that that discrepancy, right? That jump between these almost two different states of being and acknowledging that we are still living grounded in a physical plane, in a physical body, in a physical existence. I, looking at it as a bridge, I think for me is so helpful because they need to be integrated together. They're two separate things, but separate doesn't really exist. Our minds can conceptualize them and process them much easier if we look at them as separate, right? I have my human self that's going through all these things and has all of these needs. And then I have this spiritual self or this higher self that I feel called to. And what I notice often, and I've noticed this in myself, and it took some very just honest reflection over time, consistent honest reflection on my part to really see where I would use a a silver lining or a glass half full, or I'd have rose colored glasses to almost sort of wash over all of this trauma or all of this pain from my childhood almost as if it like made me a martyr. Like I I was really proud of it. I was proud that I had such a traumatizing, abusive childhood because I could walk around with a smile on my face, like a little beam of sunlight or a flower. And while that's beautiful, there was a disconnect there for me. And it was only becoming aware of this disconnect that really true healing was allowed to happen for me. And that disconnect was actually honoring that, you know, while I can have a positive outlook or I can believe in something higher, or I truly believe that there is a lesson within every trauma, that's because I choose to view it that way. If I were to take on this belief that, oh, well, there's a lesson in every trauma, so I'm just going to let them keep happening. And it means, you know, I'm gaining my wings or becoming a higher self. That's me kind of putting cement on my feet and getting myself stuck in the process of doing that. When there's a disconnect from my human self and by human self, I mean my human body, the body that is actually storing my past memories and emotions within my nervous system, staying frozen in fight or flight or having memories that trigger and bring me right back there. That's all happening in my body. If that's still happening in my body, though, in my mind, I'm up here in a more heightened philosophical or higher perspective, there's a disconnect. Those two things aren't aligned. So now I'm creating this friction and almost turbulence between my actual human self and between my spiritual self that is only actually able to come forth into existence in the world because it's transmuted through my human self. I think that's a a really beautiful way to think of it. And, you know, I noticed, you know, somewhat similarly in me, um, a tendency to over time, you know, very gradually, maybe go back to that avoidance of caring for my body. I get to a space where I'm feeling peaceful and calm and, you know, grounded and the higher self that I want to be. I'm feeling purely me, full of love and compassion for those around me. And I can continue to march along. However, what happens, I notice in my life, if I don't stay committed to caring for my body in all of the ways that I do or attempt to do consistently, which includes making sure that I'm eating nutrient meals, making sure that I'm sleeping, making sure that I'm getting rest. And for me in particular, making sure that I'm moving and stretching my body. And that's one of the ones that can, when things are feeling really good and maybe when I'm distracted with a lot of exciting, even life happening around me or stressful, whatever it might be, I then allow that to fall off. So even my best intention to be this compassionate being really does 
you lose, I lose the resources to even inhabit that space when I'm not taking care of my body. Because for me, a lifetime of accumulating all of the energy of dysregulation, of stress, of trauma, of grief, of anger, and of all the million things that I didn't have that safe outlet for is still in my body. So even in moments where I'm able to access that right state of consciousness, that pure state of who I am, those moments will only be possible if my body remains safely grounded in the present moment. And that's only possible if my needs are met. So for me, it becomes, again, this cycle of needing to not forget to care for my body so that I can even continue to be who I am or who I want to be in future moments. I think that's such a powerful baseline, what you just said about needs being met, because the reality is, if you are listening to this, you're a human being. I'm a human being. Nicole is a human being. With being a human being, there are needs that need to be met for your survival. And the, I maybe a more concise way to really mm -hmm. boil down what we're talking about here is that spiritual bypassing goes in a direction where we somehow have decided that our human needs that have been around for <laughs> centuries and centuries just no longer are there. We, we don't need them. We don't need relation. We don't need love. We don't need food shelter. We don't need <laughs> all these things that we actually do need to help us to allow us to survive and to allow us to thrive. We do have basic human needs. And when we use spirituality or a glass half full or rose colored glasses to maybe connect with good intention, connect to ourselves, to work on ourselves, to connect with our highest self, that's beautiful so you want to pay attention to where you're choosing to do that by trying to magically dissolve a very innate human need. For example, mm -hmm. I might, you know, want to, I might believe that my highest self is someone who truly embodies and practices non-attachment. I am attached to no thing. I am connected to everything. Spiritual bypassing in what we're talking about here would be me then negating the fact that I have any need for love and just saying, okay, I'm going to completely cut myself off from any need for love, any need for relation, any need for anything, because I'm connecting with my highest self and I want to practice non-attachment. That is an example of spiritual bypassing. And while I'm saying that, please be mindful that there's no morality in what I'm saying. There isn't a good or a bad or a right or a wrong or a judgment. They're simply examples. If you're spiritually bypassing yourself or experiencing it from another or maybe doing it to another and you're seeing that, that doesn't always mean that it's from malicious intent or that it was consciously thought about that you were going about doing this. What I've been learning from myself over the last couple of years is just how unconscious our own bypassing of ourselves can be and how we really can fall into using it as a scapegoat. I learned spiritual bypassing as conditioning from my mother in childhood. And I always thought it was, I just have this little positive outlook and you could give me any sort of turmoil and I will find the silver lining. That's true. And it's because I choose to see that while also honoring that in that turmoil, whatever that unresolved psychological issue or that unresolved trauma is, there are real physical feelings and sensations that need to be felt and dealt with within your body, within your nervous system. System. And I think to speak to that point, you know, when we come into the awareness of the compassionate being that I truly believe we are all at our core and, you know, maybe we have some sort of spiritual practice where we intentionally, you know, want to in embody that space. And then the reality for many of us might be faced with is that the conditioning from our past, some of us from decades ago, might be what's between us and being able to actually inhabit that space. So it might remain as an intention in my mind, but if I really am an honest witness to how I show up in the world, what I might see in my relationships is actually a lack of compassion, a lot of reactivity, a lot of defensiveness, or just a lot of diminishing and repressing or suppressing what this 
kind of very much like you're describing yourself to be, very idealized, where there's no sort of negativity, no negative view of myself or experience of myself allowed in. And again, that's another way we could be bypassing by this illusioned idea and not really taking the opportunity to walk that bridge down in observation to see, wait a minute, or to hear maybe from our loved ones who might be screaming and yelling how we're not compassionate, right? How there are many instances where we're not our body, despite well intentions, is not allowing us to actually inhabit that space of compassion, of love, and of connection. And again, for many of us, the answer might be not in this moment in time. It might be living in our mind and our bodies from a childhood experience where we didn't have that safe experience, that safe environment. I love the word compassion here. Compassion literally means feeling with. Mm -hmm. To have compassion for yourself or another is to feel. If you are not allowing yourself to feel, even of your best intention, you can't hold compassion for yourself. You can't hold compassion for another, literally by definition of the word. You have to actually allow yourself to feel and remove that personalization. Remove the the make wrong or the beating yourself up, or at least turn the volume down on it. And the goal is really to have the awareness and be able to create this space between yourself and your thoughts and what you're feeling in your body and to be able to pull back and and witness it. Witness that you are a self, you have a body, this body is experiencing and or wants to experience and needs to experience and feel out all of these sensations, all of these things that have been so wound up like a ball of twine, many of which we've been holding on to for years, if not decades. And this last year, last November, actually, it's coming up next week, it'll be exactly a year since Jake died. And in the weeks after Jake dying and the months after, it was certainly a new level of heartache that I had ever experienced. And even though I have lost literally handfuls of people that I was close to, that I would consider family, who I've lost to them passing away, to them physically dying, right? So I wasn't new to grieving or to death. Though when Jake died, I've never been so struck so deeply by such an intimate loss. And I really struggled working through the physical aspect of the pain and the physical aspect of the grief, which you can maybe hear in my voice even now. And what kept coming up for me so consistently was this voice in my head whenever I was grieving him or feeling like I wanted to throw up or fall to the ground. There was a voice in my mind that kept making myself wrong for it or kept trying to comfort myself and say, you know, you know you're connected with him. His physical self has died, but he's still here. He's with you now. And while that's beautiful, I realized that the conflict was happening because my human self as Jenna and my spiritual self as Jenna were so at odds with each other and were so at war because I had such a, a deep knowing and a really almost a poetic nature and sense of connection to Jake that is stronger now than ever when he was alive. And I'm very rooted in that and very grateful to be so tuned into my heart and that collective heartbeat really of the universe to be able to feel that. Though that would get me very easily into a spiritual bypassing territory if I were to lean and put all of my eggs in that basket and completely disregard the fact that my human felt like it was falling apart. I didn't, I couldn't really, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get myself to a balanced place unless I was just completely dissociated and completely numb. And I had, I was very fortunate to have friends who do tremendous grief work. David Kessler is one of them, his book, Finding Meaning, The Sixth Stage of Grief, I highly recommend. He actually did, led a workshop in the Self Healer Circle, our online global membership, the day that Jake was being lowered into the ground at his funeral service, which is really ironic. And also, I truly believe not a coincidence. And David's partner also does grief yoga, moving grief and trauma through our body, actually getting a physical release. And I did a one-on-one -on -one session with him. His name is Paul Deniston. He also has a book. Um, I think it's called Healing with Yoga. 
or healing through yoga or grief yoga. It's all around grief yoga. And in that session, I was doing all these crazy, weird movements, noises. It was extremely uncomfortable for me, but I was so at a point of breaking that I honestly, I didn't care. I needed to move. I needed to make these sounds in a very if you were to be an onlooker, it would maybe feel startling or odd or alarming, though it was so primal and so healing and so releasing. And it was through my conversations with Paul that I was really able to see, oh my God, I'm so trying to just be spiritually okay and be like a an angel around all of this when in reality, I am a 3D human. I live in a human body that needs food and shelter and sleep and air. And I have completely negated taking care of that part of me, which has just made all of the friction and all of the grief even worse. I really, really, Jenna, as always, appreciate not only you sharing um, your experiences around Jake, but you really giving us this example. I think that's a really great illustration of that conflict that at odds. And I think as we accumulate this spiritual knowing and desire and intention for ourselves, that conflict gets even stronger where we can very much like you're describing shame, the reality that most of us as adults, we don't know really how to functionally that is navigate these bodies. If I'll just speak from my own lived experience, I spent so little time and I had no modeling or help in learning how to care for my particular body, what my body needed. I especially didn't have help when I was dysregulated or having an emotion. So checking out from that body was that safe space. So now accumulating many years of spiritual knowledge, very much intentionally wanting to be that compassionate being, that doesn't miraculously teach me how to navigate my body. When I disembarked from the spaceship and came back in and landed here, it was just as overwhelming, if not more than when I left it so many years ago. So what you're really talking about is the reality that when we are in this human body, so much of us, so many of us are going to feel broken, destabilized, completely incapacitated by these energies that will bring us back to this very primal place. So few of us having confidence in our body's ability to tolerate it. So in that moment, spiritually bypassing, going on our spaceship, distracting, whatever it is, becomes the safest place. So again, continuing to learn how to be that bridge for ourselves, because our body is the channel of our lived experience here, whether we like it or not, and learning how to navigate our individual bodies and how to regulate our bodies and how to be with our bodies in difficult times is so much of the healing journey for the very many of us who don't yet know, who when we drop in, it is primal, it is overwhelming, and it doesn't feel like a place that we really want to spend much time in at all. And it's all happening all at the same time. You are your primal self the same moment that you are your spiritual self. There is not a single one of us here in these walking, talking, breathing bodies that isn't a spiritual being in a human being <laughs> body or a human being that also is a spiritual being. They are transmuted through one another. They literally go hand in hand. So is a moment, I think, for all of us to just have a little compassion <laughs> with ourselves and maybe a little laugh at really how odd and how <laughs> funny it is that we are these such, you know, superb advanced <laughs> beings or species and yet... <laughs> We think that we can just live all up here in our mind and completely degrade this thing <laughs> down here and not take care of it, not look after it and just expect that my body is going to keep showing up for me day after day as I evolve on this spiritual journey. Eventually, <laughs> your spiritual journey in this lifetime is going to come to an end because your physical body gave out because you weren't honoring it. You weren't taking care of it. If you're progressing or evolving in a spiritual sense, that's beautiful if you're not taking your body with you <laughs> and resolving some of that trauma, unwinding that ball of twine that is in you and actually allowing your nervous system and literally your cells to feel those feelings, to be compassionate with yourself, to embody compassion means to feel. You have to feel in order to heal. When you let your body experience that, maybe literally carving out time and space. I did an awkward as hell yoga <laughs> session with Paul Denniston and just cried and screamed it out, pretended I was chopping wood. Like I know it sounds bizarre and it felt 
bizarre. It also was so healing. It was so freeing. After that hour session that was completely by myself with Paul, and again, you don't have to do a session with another person. This was something I was offered and I was very grateful for and truly was just at a place of bring it on. I will try anything because this hurts so bad. There was a huge breakthrough after that and a huge release if not only for the fact that I was so proud of myself for even allowing myself to acknowledge that I am this 3D human who feels very stuck and I'm making all of this beautiful spiritual sense about my newly dead brother, yet I'm over here physically suffering and I'm aware enough now and responsible enough now about making my own choices for myself, parenting my own self, to know that I was leading myself down a path that I didn't want to go down if I were to completely ignore my physical body. I know enough about my nervous system now. I know enough about how trauma shows up in my body. I know that trauma I experience when I'm two is living in my body if I haven't dealt with it or felt with it. And with that awareness, we can open ourselves up to being compassionate with ourselves and allowing ourselves to integrate the two because unbeknownst to us, we came into this earth with them integrated. They have been all a part of this same system the whole time, but we don't acknowledge that. We put such a focus on one or the other instead of really understanding that all of the power and the acceleration in our evolution is with your spirituality and your physical human body going hand in hand. This conversation is really illustrative of the shift um, that I made in even in my own practice, right? Coming from a training program that focused solely on the mind and absence of the body, really understanding that, wait a minute, we have to factor the body in and then even more so, wait even a more minute, there's something else. There is this unique energy essence space that determines the choices that I will make that will be different, I'm sure, than choices anyone else will make. We are unique entities, essences, spiritual beings, whatever you call it. And for me, working from that very limited view, I mean, we've heard the word stuck come up even in this conversation today. I mean, that was the number one word and disempowering space of being. I mean, any of us who have felt stuck can I'm sure attest to how hopeless that can feel. And even as it applies to this conversation, as we gain spiritual awareness, knowledge, and we aspire intentionally to be that being, even more so how frustrating it can be not to be able to actually embody that space in our life and in our relationships. And chances are the reason is because we're not viewing ourselves as the whole integrated system that we are. We have a mind that is incredibly powerful. We're living in a body that also is incredibly powerful and we were driven by the uniqueness of spirit, of soul, of essence, whatever it is that makes each of us us. And until we really expand ourselves and make space, we're going to remain stuck, stuck, frustrated, and not able to be who we truly, truly are. And as we're getting ready to end here, as always, honoring all of you beings who are tuning in, whether you're viewing us on the YouTube channel or on, or on any of the podcast platforms, Um, You being in community, showing up, being a participant and listener in all of these conversations really does mean the world to us. So as always, sharing our gratitude for all of you out there who are tuning in, who are sharing episodes that resonate with you and who are writing reviews on whatever platform it is. We so, so gratefully appreciate all of you and are looking forward to continuing this conversation with you on next episode of The Soundboard.